discussion panel on military spending as a source of innovation and economic development. My name is Paulina Zamelek, and I'm research fellow at Puaski Foundation with background on defense issues in the Polish government administration, defense industry, and currently academic. So military spending innovation and development are crucially in my interest. Therefore, it's my extraordinary pleasure to host this panel with such distinguished five speakers, four of them on site with us here, and one online. Here they are, Admiral Mateo Bistelia, if I pronounce it correctly, Director of the Organization for Joint Armament Cooperation, known to all of us, I guess, as OCAR, Mr. Piotr Darzyński, President of Łukasiewicz Research Network in Poland, Madame, Ms. Jadwiga Emilewicz, under currently Member of Parliament, Deputy Prime Minister of Poland of 2020, Mr. Marek Niedużak, Under Secretary of State, Ministry of Development and Technology in Poland. And the online speaker is Colonel Andrea Truppo, representing Ministry of Defense in Italy. Can you hear us? Sure. Good morning to everybody. So, welcome to all of you and thank you again for accepting this invitation to this particular discussion panel. A few technicalities. Uh, the topic is lengthy, but we have uh, just limited amount of time. So I would like to ask all of us for short intervention up to, at the most, five minutes. We also welcome questions from the audience, either Polish or English. So whenever the audience is ready, please raise your hand. We'll take questions sometimes in a row if there is a need. So, as defense is generally regarded in the economic literature as the state's sovereign functional function par excellence, military spending constitutes a very peculiar category of uh, public expenditure. There are models for demand and supply side, techno technological spin offs from civilian to defense and back. So, however, spending, especially military spending, is very complex and it's mostly diverted to political and strategic dimension. So that's the justification for the constitution of this particular panel. Without further ado, let me ask the first question to our first, first panelist, Admiral Matteo. So, OCAR perspective, what is the impact of military expense on innovation in terms of OCAR? Thank you very much, Pauline. First of all, I would like to uh, express my pleasure and honor to be here in this uh, important forum. And this is the first time that I come to Poland, so the privilege is double. Uh, regarding uh, your question, I, I would like to say that uh, oh, there is a, a strong impact uh, between the expenses, uh, military expenses, and innovativeness of OCAR. OCAR, which is a very big agency in Europe, and maybe also in the world, but is not very much well known. So I would like to spend just two words about that, because OCAR is an agency that can manage programs and, and therefore big contracts, cooperation contracts, along the life cycle which means from the development to the disposal. So I said, I use the word of the development. The development is fundamental for the innovativeness. And uh, you have more innovativeness, so there is big impact on OCRA and OCRA fosters for that, is a part of this. If uh, more nations cooperate together, if more nations can contribute to this innovativeness. Therefore, this brings directly to the cooperation. Without the cooperation, everything goes, you know, in a lower level. The expenditure in military assets in Europe is not that big as we will know. And therefore, how can you innovate? How can you have big innovativeness if you don't have enough money to do it? So only together, and in Europe, if we share all together, we you know, put more money on the plate, maybe we could also have a bigger impact on that. 
But I said that Ocar has a big impact on the innovativeness. That's because if you take into, into consideration some of our major programs, like the A400M, which is a very unique uh, uh, transport strategic and tactical uh, the tra transport aircraft in Europe, we, the development was about 4 billion, which means there is a lot of, and uh, for those who know this airplane, they can see that the innovativeness is very, very high. But uh, I, I just made an example. We are going to, to build the new European drone, real European asset. Also, the ESSOR, uh, the new radio, which is European radio that can be, can be interoperable with all the uh, countries in, in Europe, without forgetting all the naval assets that we are developing. So, I really uh, think that uh, OCAR, there is a big impact between the expenditure and OCAR in terms of innovativeness, but also OCAR can play a key role in this. Yeah, you remember that also Poland is participating, or was participating in ESSOR program, as which you mentioned. <coughs> Sorry. Um, let's move now into the Polish environment. And the question to Dr. Piotr Tarciński, the president of Łukasiewicz uh, Research Network in Poland. So, uh, speaking about innovation, development, well, <coughs> I admire the idea that uh, the Łukasiewicz Research network has been um, in initialized and is operation for the, um, almost three years. However, comparing the defense aspects, unfortunately, we see on the Polish defense market that innovative projects are in decline, both in number and financing, right? So it seems like Poland is investing in um, foreign purchasing, like for HIMARS, for Patriot. And as I have seen in the last two years, uh, there are no defense-related projects contracted with um, NCBR. On the other side, the Łukasiewicz net research uh, network is flourishing, and um, the 32 institutes are operating with each other, and it works. What's the solution? How did you do it? Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a really great honor to be here with you. Uh, I, I will now switch to Polish. There is a sens very sensitive topic when we discussed about the, the uh, security and uh, defense, so I would like to do this in Polish and to tell you about the projects that we can do together with uh, public and private companies in the area of uh, security and uh, defense. So now in Polish, uh, uh, rzeczywiście mamy na pewno problem ze zmniejszoną liczbą uh, projektów. I to jest też powód, dla którego powstała sieć badawcza Łukasiewicz, bo żeby we właściwy sposób wykorzystywać strumienie finansowania, trzeba mieć po pierwsze dobrze zdefiniowane tematy projektów, które chcemy realizować. I tutaj zawsze z naszej strony jest pytanie po pierwsze do polskiej armii, po drugie do grupy PGZ, która jest realizatorem tych projektów. Ale nawet jak dobrze zdefiniujemy, czego potrzebuje polska armia, czego, potrze czego potrzebuje PGZ, jakie są potrzeby na rynku związanym z obronnością, to potrzebujemy jeszcze właściwych zespołów, które są w stanie zrealizować te projekty. A ponieważ dzisiaj wszystkie projekty, aż projekty związane z obronnością i bezpieczeństwem w sposób szczególny, wymagają kooperacji i budowania bardzo szerokich konsorcjów, to Łukasiewicz jest właśnie odpowiedzią na to, że my chyba za mało mieliśmy tej możliwości budowania szerokich konsorcjów. Dzisiaj my mamy nieco ponad dwa lata. Zrzeszamy, tak jak pani powiedziała, 32 instytuty. To jest 40 tysięcy pracowników, inżynierów, naukowych, pracowników badawczych. Jesteśmy w stanie dużo efektywniej budować te konsorcja. Może tego jeszcze tak wyraźnie nie widać, ale też pamiętamy o jednej rzeczy, że Pani wspomniała o danych z 2019 i 2020 roku, to też jest jednak czas epidemii, a projekty budowane w obszarze obronności wymagają jednak trochę bardziej indywidualnych kontaktów niż tylko telekonferencje online, tak więc myślę, że tutaj też jest odłożony efekt jednak sytuacji epidemiologicznej i to powinno się bardzo szybko zmienić. Dlaczego wydaje mi się, że powinno się zmienić? Dlatego, że 
rusza nowa perspektywa, uruchomiony jest Europejski Fundusz Obronnościowy, ruszają nowe konkursy w Narodowym Centrum Badań i Rozwoju. Nakłady na projekty B plus R generalnie rosną, no więc teraz jest tylko kwestia tego, żebyśmy umieli rozwinąć tę część związaną z obronnością i bezpieczeństwem, a potencjał jest duży. My go widzimy co najmniej w takich kilku najważniejszych dla nas obszarach. Znaczy pierwsze to są w ogóle technologie rakietowe. Jesteśmy w stanie tutaj od generatorów prochowych po paliwo. Mamy bardzo ciekawe projekty, systemy sterowania tymi, tymi systemami rakietowymi. Drugi obszar bardzo ciekawy dla nas są platformy bezzałogowe i związane trochę z tym roboty do zastosowań militarnych. I tu mamy duże sukcesy nie tylko w Łukasiewicz i LOT, ale mamy także duże sukcesy w Łukasiewicz Piap. Czyli to są instytuty, które produkują dzisiaj i co najważniejsze sprzedają także do polskiej armii. Ostatnio sprzedaliśmy 35 robotów do zastosowania na polu, na polu walki. I kolejny obszar wydaje mi się bardzo ciekawy z perspektywy też naszych międzynarodowych partnerów. To są tranzystory na azotku galu. Mamy tutaj wyraźnie bardziej zaawansowany projekt niż jeszcze do rok, dwa lata temu, chociaż to jest technologia z gatunku, z gatunku cutting edge, no więc tutaj trzeba mieć trochę cierpliwości. Chcielibyśmy opracować tranzystory na bazie azotku galu, nie na krzemie, tylko na azotku galu, do zastosowań w, w modułach nadawczo-odbiorczych do, do, do systemów radarowych, które służą zarówno do zwalczania samolotów, jak i też systemów antyrakietowych. No więc to, co się jak gdyby zmieniło w ciągu tych dwóch lat i myślę, co za chwilę będzie widać, to to, że jesteśmy lepiej przygotowani do tego, żeby budować zespoły. Mamy precyzyjnie zdefiniowane nasze, nasze kompetencje. Czekamy teraz na zamówienia ze strony armii, ze strony PGZ i wtedy te, te strumienie finansowania powinny się, delikatnie mówiąc, odkorkować także w Narodowym Centrum Badań i Rozwoju. I'm very happy to hear that. So it seems like there is a light in the tunnel somewhere. I will have a dozen of questions as a follow-up questions to do later on, but now let's move to Madame Jadwiga Milewicz. Um, let me jump from topic to topic, so just to make the audience possibility to also to choose the kind of areas which you like to go into deep. So, Mr. Milewicz, in general, it's not easy to measure the impact of military spending on economic development or innovation. This impact is certainly smaller on the economies of countries such as those in Central and Eastern Europe, obviously. One of them is, of course, Poland, so with lower impact. The expectations of the user for defense, meaning the army, is that army wants modern equipment, equipment shall be manufactured by state-owned companies, so here is the question. Do you share the opinion that the restrictions of manufacturers of military equipment to state-owned companies inhibits innovation? Such activities may hinder development of private companies, discourage them from focusing on research on development. What's your opinion on that? Once again, thank you very much for the invitation for this conference. It's only occurred how, how, how eager and how hungry all of us were being during last year not to meet each other, each other personally. But uh, coming back to your question, it is, uh, I wouldn't say that it is the opposition between state-owned companies and the uh, uh, private companies. It is not an opposition and definitely it should not be that uh, in the defense sector. So, if I let me bring uh, in my memories the first meeting in the Ministry of Development, which I run, and uh, just before, just at the very beginning of the discussion about the European Defence Fund. And it was the Ministry which arranged the meeting, not the Ministry of Defence, with the presence of the representative of the, uh, the Defence Sector, and Defence Minister. And uh, it was more than 100 companies which were gathered together very interested in the program, very encouraged the politicians in taking part in this very difficult, openly say, from, uh, for the Polish industry uh, found. And uh, so we've got, let's say, the national champion, the big entities, state-owned companies, which are producing, let's say, the defense hardware. But there is a, also a lot of plenty, small and medium-sized companies, uh, private, even not small and medium size only, but also the big one, which uh, provides some equipment and basically IT um, solutions for, uh, for not only Polish Army, which were, are well known in many different destinations, not only in Europe, but also outside. So we see that there is a 
lower co collaboration between state-owned and the private market defense um, sector in Poland, but both of them are existing. So this is the first, uh, the first point. The second one, which you quite closely define why it is so difficult. What is, uh, if you are talking about uh, innovation, innovation is a risk. Innovation means that uh, in a, 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 a public procurement, you are open for mistakes even. So the mistake and the risk is definitely nothing that uh, the representatives from the army are looking for. Yeah? So the, the proven uh, thing, the proven stuff is something that, uh, uh, that the leaders of, uh, uh, of the defense sector of um, um, in the state are looking for. So, so, so this is a tension, I would say. So the tension is not between the state and the private, but between uh, the expectations of the army and something that can be provided from the market. And of course, it is very easy to buy, to, 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 uh, to buy very brand new tools and toys for this market. Maybe sometimes not developed in the Łukasiewicz uh, um, uh, Institute. And I would say maybe this is not something very specific for the Polish market. I think that this, uh, it is well, well known everywhere. And uh, so if I may say uh, just the world, of course it is, and last year question, whether we can count the expenditure on the defense and uh, if, if, whether it is profitable for uh, the economy or not. Of course, it is not that difficult. It was everyone who wrote the book, uh, Adriana Mazzucato of Entrepreneurial State knows, and the huge the, um, uh, investigation about our smartphones. All of us knew that uh, most uh, everything has been developed in this entity at the end of the day was spent mostly by the defense um, uh, agency, US defense agency, which provided um, technology by technology, which then was gathered to the uh, uh, to the smartphone, but uh, so so you can very easily see how, in a long term perspective, of course, not immediately, in a long term perspective, those expenditures are coming back in a very hard economy, and how profitable for the for the state economy uh, they are. If I may just say just one word at the end, uh, uh, recommendation for 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 Poland right now is, of course, first of all, once again, we should actively seek, as, um, as the government, uh, how to gain from the European Defense Fund. It should be definitely one of the central goals for the Polish administration. So, firstly, uh, we need a robust co co cooperation and the new procedures within the government to help our industry in their efforts to build international consortia, which is not very easy, which is very difficult. So secondly, we should strengthen once again our presence in Brussels as the administration, but also the industrial presence in Brussels uh, to, to, for the advocacy of the solutions. And last but not least, we should do our best to enable our companies to join EDF as not only as a junior partners, but also as a leader. So, so this is something that I would strongly recommend to the Polish government nowadays. And in a, by the companies, I understand both those state-owned, but also those private ones. Nothing to add, just I, I do agree very much. So we will stay with comparison between Poland and the Western countries, so to say, on political approach. The question to Minister Niedużak. Some of the Western countries, like France, Portugal, not to mention, of course, the United States, have policies and strategies addressed at the defense-related startups and SMEs. This mechanism accelerates their innovativeness and, in consequence, development of some modern military systems needed for the armed forces, obviously. So what's more, it foresees uh, long-term investment, not only for innovative systems with their lifetime operating costs, but also jobs, additional taxes, etc. And such perspective obviously is much longer than any parliamentary tenure. So, well, we don't have any strategy for defense sector. Would you foresee such adequate measures, tools directed at defense sector? Uh, uh, thanks for that question. <clears throat> Uh, let me just uh, join all the other panel members in saying that I'm really honored to, to be here with you. I think the forum has already um, established itself as a very important platform 
uh, of discussion uh, uh, regarding issues of security. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to answer the question, but let me also build a little bit on what has already been uh, uh, has already been said, um, uh, uh, because I think that this sort of uh, division, state-owned, privately-owned companies, um, it has its another dimension that we should bear in mind, and this another dimension. The, another dimension is really connected to your question. Um, it so happens that usually, at least in, 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 in Poland, uh, state-owned companies are this, let's say, old industry uh, production, far bigger companies, and privately owned are usually smaller, more agile, usually uh, cutting edge, high technology, very often cybersecurity. Uh, it's not something that we should criticize, it's just the way it is. It's, and, and, and I think everyone who's interested in the subject understands uh, why this division looks like that. And now, I think we need both, yeah? We were, uh, with Mr. Admiral, we were just having a little chat before we entered the room. And uh, if I could quote you, I hope I can, that uh, you said that there is no European Union without industry. And that's a very good point, very obvious on one, one, on one hand, because this is how the European Union started, with, with uh, union cooperation within uh, first coal and energy industries. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this, this, this point is very important today, both in the context of, let's say, Fit for 55, but it's also very important in the context of military spending. We need that big industry. So in, uh, in Polish uh, context, we need this Polish big state-owned companies because they are that industry. Uh, while those privately owned smaller companies, we need them too, but they yeah. are... Uh, they are a different breed, yeah? It's a very different situation. And I think we, we need them, we can see, especially as we have, I don't know, even what happened yesterday evening, yeah? When, when, when we saw very big platforms of communication collapsing uh, suddenly, uh, we, we, we understand that uh, this, this area of cybersecurity, especially, which will not be, let's be clear about it, which will not be, let's say, addressed by those big state-owned industrial companies, they will be addressed by those privately owned smaller um, uh, companies. We need that sort of, we need that dimension of security as well. So we need, we need both, if I could say, we need both uh, arms, if I could say so, or we need to stand on both legs, maybe. Now, uh, going back to your question, the, the problem with this strategy in Polish context is that if you want to have a special program for startups, a special program for newly funded companies, there is a very important factor that you need to bear in mind, and it's a factor that makes it very difficult for, for the government, any government. It's that more or less, I mean, the data are, um, is sl sometimes slightly different, but the, the thing is that around 80% of those companies uh, go bankrupt or don't, 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 uh, don't perform that well, and they end within one, two, or three years. And that's something really difficult to accept for someone who's spending public money. And for someone who is uh, in, in defense context, is thinking about you know, security, building a security not for one or two years, but in a, in, in a longer term. Uh, so that makes it very difficult. It's a very big challenge for us to build a specific strategy that would, uh, that would focus on uh, SMEs or startups uh, in, um, uh, in, in defense area. But what we are doing as Ministry for uh, Economic Development, responsible for economy as a whole, not for just one sector, is we, we do try to develop both in terms of uh, funding, financing, but also in terms of regulatory framework. We do try to create, a, let's say, a friendly environment or a more friendly environment for star star startups and SMEs. And of course, that means also startups or SMEs that have something to do with Usually it's cybersecurity or let's say new technologies, but there is this security dimension to what they do. And you know, to be more specific, to give you some examples, I could talk about uh, a special tax relief for research and development, a special tax relief for IP box. There will be a new uh, tax relief uh, that's part of 
what's called Pol Polski Ład, the Polish deal, is already um, uh, on its way to Senate. So there is an element that has been a cooperation, or it was developed in cooperation between us and Ministry of Finances, and it's a new tax relief that um, that's addressed uh, to companies that invest in in, in robots and au automatization of their of their production. And more on the regulatory uh, side, uh, I think we just have to mention. Uh, uh, the Prosta Spółka Akcyjna, which is called uh, the Simple Joint Stock, let's call it like that, company, uh, uh, which finally, uh, thank, uh, we're very happy, finally started to, um, uh, I mean, you can, you can, you can set it up uh, from, the, uh, from the middle of this year, I think 1st first, first of June or 1st of, 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 of July. So I understand there's a lot to be done, and as I said, it's very challenging because we are talking about public money that always needs to be spent um, in a way that can be justified then, not only to, uh, not only to, to the minister, but also to, let's say, NIC, yeah, the, the chamber of, of, of audit. Uh, uh, so it's a big challenge. We're trying to do it uh, horizontally, not focusing specifically on defense uh, sector, but if we succeed or if we see good results, I think this experience can be then used and um, implemented uh, in regard to, uh, to defense uh, sector, uh, SMEs and startups. I understand. I saw that, um, um, well, Admiral Vistelia uh, wanted to react directly yeah. on this intervention. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, comment what uh, Mr. Marek and uh, Mrs. Jadwiga, right? <laughs> Uh, said because uh, this is the job, the work that I normally do. There is no Europe uh, if there is no, in, you know, common industry. I think I am not discovering anything new. The problem is that today, and I think everybody here can uh, assist to the fragmentation that uh, there is in Europe, in the naval area. Every country has its own kind of type of ship, which is the similar, the same one that other nations have. And I, I would, shall we talk about the tanks? Shall we talk about uh, uh, the fighters, airplanes, helicopters? So there is a fragmentation. The, and plus, uh, the very bad thing is that these nations, these, uh, these industries, they are competitors. So when we go outside, each one is a competitor with, the, for example, U.S. industry or China, Chinese industry, but also competitor of European industries, which means that we kill each other. So the European Defense Fund was born for this, for this purpose, to put everything together. But except MBDA and somewhat Airbus, can you tell me another chain of industries that make Europe, there isn't. And who has to push on that? I think the governments, the, the politics is a sovereign. So I fully uh, support what you said. And if we want to spend well money, and now I come to your uh, discussion, we have to cooperate. Without cooperation, also in this case, we do nothing. We discussed about, uh, you said about, you know, big industries and the uh, SMIs. Well, the two are complementary. Big industry is the protection of the nation for many reasons. SMIs is the richness of any nation. This is my uh, full conviction that I have. We need both. And you, you said, uh, Madame, that uh, uh, we, have, we should look at more the market. That's fine for some things, it depends. For other things, we need to innovation, to, to, to make innovation things. We need to explore new technologies. And these new technologies are fundamental, not only for the military assets, but also for civilian assets. And therefore, we need to spend more money. But in this, in this case, we spend correctly. The money, but the key is the cooperation. If uh, we uh, cooperate, and I can tell you, I'm an expert on that because Ocar is uh, 
was born for cooperation. And I can tell you, I have big problems among the countries because of the fragmentation I was, I was telling about. Therefore, what uh, the nations and the politics should do more is to push for more cooperation and for the joint, real joint venture, real, real uh, unique industries that can feed the small and medium enterprises. Because all over Europe, there are, you know, areas where there, is, there are excellences that we might not even know. Thank okay. you so much. I wanted to go into deep on, on such issues of cooperation and later fragmentation. However, we still have the fifth speaker, which is online, who is online, and that's uh, Colonel Andrea Truppo. Can you still hear us, I hope? Yes? Yeah, I do. So do the, question, the question to you is, um, uh, Colonel Truppo, being in charge of uh, Eurofighter program, and actually in your career you have been responsible for the subjects related to military cooperation, this is the topic that we, are, we have just raised, in aeronautic domain, as well as the subject of military spending supporting innovation and broader economic growth in nations. Can you tell us what's the mechanism behind this public spending driven growth in innovative sectors and how could the lessons, be, the lessons learned be driven out of that for Poland especially? Please. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. It's very, very relevant and it's a very complex argument. First of all, let me thank you for the invitation. It's an honor for me to take part of such a distinguished forum. Uh, so basically, when we talk about uh, defense procurement, um, we usually focus our attention on the, on the military domain. Uh, and we consider this expenditure as a cost to obtain the military capability that our armed forces or army forces, naval forces require to cope with the, with the emerging threat. However, such defense strategic procurement run at least on, uh, on uh, four different domains. Um, mainly, there is the operational domain, but then there is the strategic technology and industrial base in terms of, uh, of a strategic industrial policy. Then there is the international relationship, and there is also the economic growth. We are living an innovation-driven economy that, by the way, has the same point of, of, of origin of, uh, of uh, all the society that we are living. I strongly believe that uh, the world we, we know today uh, has been mainly, mainly driven and influenced by the Second World War. During, during that time, something very, very important happened, mainly for, uh, for very few people uh, that understood this, this huge progress and, and basically made it happen. Uh, if you allow me just uh, two minutes to, 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 to give a very sparring story that I believe will give you the right perspective and help to, 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 to put, um, to put uh, the, the specific information about the cooperation program fighter or, or the FKS in the right perspective. So during the Second World War, uh, for instance, there was this, uh, this uh, American character, Vannevar Bush, that is not very well known, but in, in my opinion, uh, he made a, a huge difference for, for, for the futures of the Western uh, culture. Um, he was the scientific coordinator of uh, the American president, at that time was Roosevelt, and he was the coordinator for the Manhattan Project. He invested in the radiation lab when uh, Winston Churchill decided to share uh, all the technical secrets related to the uh, British technology to the US with the magnetron. He basically built inside the MIT a radiation lab and he funded this radiation lab where the MIT received in, the, in, in four years more than 80 times that the funding they received in the 80 years before. So the results that were achieved during those four years were beyond any reasonable expectation. So that Roosevelt wrote a letter to this Vannevar Bush to say, how can we keep going with the same pace and try to fight and win against the future's emerging threat, against the poverty and against the disease? 
And Bernie Verbush replied to the president. Unfortunately, the reply uh, came after uh, Roosevelt died, and so was was read by Truman with a, with a, a paper that it's named uh, uh, "Science: The Endless Frontiers." That I believe it's very very illuminating, and it's very uh, uh, still very very true. So basically, he, he said that to face the challenge, the most relevant activity is huge investment in research and development uh, because research and development drives innovation. Innovation, by definition, is the effect of a recombination of many things and more things you try to put together and the highest is the potential to generate innovation. And if you put things together and you know how to control them, the effect can be exponential. Innovation, by definition, it's not predictable. So the risk, it's too high and cannot be managed only by the private sector, only by the industry. So basically, Baniva Bush said that this is mainly a government-funded activity. But the government-funded activity that, as uh, was said before, it's not just about funding. It's also about to generate the right culture, to generate innovation. That is mainly, as was said just before, it's related to the culture of innovation that uh, uh, promote and respect the tolerance to failure. That it's, it does not belong to people who makes operation or people who has to go after profit with, with commercial posture. So while in Europe, after the Second World War, um, people were rebuilding their cities, and by the way, they were leaders in technology. German and, and British was leading the worldwide technology. In the United States, they were launched many, many government agencies like NASA, DARPA, NIH, uh, NSF. And those agencies made a huge step change and built the, build the economy that we now see uh, in, in the United States and the old Western, uh, Western, uh, Western country. Um, basically, in less than four decades, the leadership, first from the technology side and soon after from economic and military, uh, uh, moved, moved uh, to the United States. How this work, why it's like that, and why, and actually this was so profound that influenced a new economic theory that from the 1950, basically the economic theory changed uh, very much and basically everybody now recognized that the economy, it's uh, allowed to grow forever and can grow at the rate that we see growing just because there is innovation, production of a new idea. And in this respect, also thanks to the very last uh, Nobel Prize from Paul Romer, this is mainly related to institution. This is mainly related to all the complex of institutional activity. And one of these, it's by nature, it's by definition, uh, um, strategic uh, defense procurement. Why is that? Because by definition, the uh, military requirements is so challenging that is basically uh, um, concepted to, to get an edge, to get an advantage from the enemy. So it's so complex, it should be so innovative so that the enemy also with the proper investment and proper skill cannot stay up to pace. So once you make such a very challenging requirement, then thousands of engineers start to put their knowledge and to build something that is innovative by definition. All those knowledge are trapped inside the product. And actually, it's just to satisfy a very, very narrow requirement. But however, if you know how to uh, explore all the potential of those knowledge that is inside the product, then you generate an, a huge spillover effect that moves along many other domains. For instance, if you consider satellite technology or uh, internet technology, the satellite technology was basically just implemented to satisfy a very narrow and specific objective. So, uh, 
while Russians were shooting down a U2 that were doing pictures over the Soviet Union, uh, they decided to go higher and to make pictures from the sky so to be, to be safe. So this was a very, very narrow and specific requirement. If you consider and compare what has been the result and the return over that investment, if you consider that nowadays every one of us uh, works with at least three satellites in their pocket, so the same with internet, the same with, uh, with the semantic speech recognition. Those were all investment driven by defense for a very, very specific uh, objective that later on were basically generating a very wide spillover effect with a huge impact of the economic growth, with a huge yes. impact I hope that on you the, can hear us. the uh, international relationship. Yes, can you hear us? Yes, we are running out of yeah, time. And exactly this topic which you mentioned right now, spillover effect, that's, that's the one which I started from uh, at the beginning. And it's very important for military investments and the progress into civilian and backwards, right? And as it seems, everybody has their own views, and the views are actually supporting each other. So, having said that, I thank you all of the panelists, because we have just run out of time. Thank you so much, and I hope that there, we will have still some time in, during the conference to, to speak and to continue with the dozens of questions which still we, all of us, have about this particular topic. Thank you again, all of you.